Well, back and guess who I'm back with? Look who's over here. There is Dr. Dan Brubaker. If Dr. Dan Brubaker is in the scene with me, you know what this means. This is the new course. This is his course. Uh, this is the one where he actually expounds all of his expertise on the Quran. This is the Quran course that you've all been waiting for. It's coming up in just a few weeks on June the 19th, Monday, June the 19th. And it's called a historical assessment of the Quran. This will be the second time actually that Dan has taught this course. Uh, he did it two years ago in 2021. And what he's going to do, he's going to do exactly as the uh, title says. He's going to expound on the historical problems, the historical ability, what the Quran was, what it is today, how we came to it, uh, what are some of the internal problems with the Quran. I'm going to let him explain each one because this course is eight sessions, eight lectures, starting from June the 19th, going right up to August the 7th. That's every Monday night, as we do with all of our MAPI courses, every Sunday night, sorry, Monday night, going from 8 o'clock in the evening Eastern time up to 10 o'clock. That's the lecture period, and then we open it up to Q&A after that. Now, Daniel, you're here. This is your second time you've done this course. What I'd like you to do, could you kind of walk us through the different lectures uh, week by week by week and just tell us what you're going to do? Give us a summary, an overview of what we should expect. Sure, uh, Dr. Smith. Yes, this is uh, going to be a pleasure to teach this course uh, for a second time. And um, the course is, uh, as you said, a, an overview of the uh, critical introduction to uh, the Quran, a historical um, look at the Quran. And uh, we're going to start out the course by uh, not assuming very much from the, from the students. People may be having different starting points, but um, we'll start broad and then go um, deep uh, into a number of different specific areas in order to give a, a good solid background. But of course, um, the first thing that we uh, that I always try to do is to not assume that uh, everybody knows what the what the Quran is. And actually, the, the question of what is the Quran is, <laughs> it, it could have many different answers. But uh, we want to begin the course on that first week by um, having a, a general overview of the um, of the uh, when the Quran came into uh, being when it's first attested as a physical object and, and, and what it is, how it's uh, structured and laid out, what sort of themes it deals with. And we'll deal with many of these things in more depth later. But, um, but also to uh, just understand from the, uh, from the inside and from the outside what, um, what, we're, what we're talking about when we talk about the Quran, what it is. Um, or what you understand it to be has a, a bearing or an impact on how you approach it and, and start to the sort of questions that you ask uh, when we look at it. And we're asking some very interesting questions and uh, we're not alone in that. Many, many people are doing that. But, um, but it's important to, to begin by having sort of an overview mm -hmm. of, uh, of the Quran. Many people don't even realize what, what the Quran's contents are, um, what it's... Um, that it deals with biblical themes very heavily, um, that it mentions people that you uh, see appearing in the Bible uh, frequently, not all of them, but many of them, and um, and also that it has um, some very important differences, both theologically and structurally, and um, uh, uh, in terms of the style of uh, the literature and, and so forth. So we'll talk about all those kind of things. Dan, Dan, what I would like you to do now is just go through for each week. So starting with week one, what is the lecture on? Then week two, what would be the lecture on? Week three, what will be the lecture one by one? Yep. So the people who are watching, you, uh, they want to know exactly what you're going to be lecturing on, what they should expect, starting with week one. Go ahead, over to you again. Yeah, so week one, we're I have uh, readings for each week set up to sort of set the stage for the uh, for the discussion. And week one, we have a book by uh, Michael Cook, The Quran, A Very Short Introduction. This is Oxford University Press. Uh, some people watching this may be familiar with Oxford's uh, series that seems to have become very popular, very short introductions. Well, Michael Cook is a, uh, a recognized, established uh, scholar of, um, of the Quran. And so we're going to start out by taking his nice little very short introduction and talking about that to do get that overview that I was just mentioning. 
of the Quran. And then we're also going to be dealing with um, Watt and Bell's uh, introduction to the Quran. Watt and Bell are uh, both um, scholars of uh, gener a couple generations ago, and um, they wrote a very good um, scholarly and uh, critical um, work uh, among many that uh, will help us to also set the stage. And then we'll look, as, uh, as we will do throughout the course on that night, I'm going to be having uh, students go through actual texts. We're going to be interacting with the Quran itself. So um, chapter three, Surah three of the Quran will be uh, read in preparation for that lecture. And we will talk about it and just to begin to get a, um, uh, a feel and talk about the themes and contents of that, uh, students' initial reactions. And um, uh, that, so that will form the, uh, the focus of our, of our study that night. So that's, that's the first week. The uh, second week, um, we will begin to go a little bit more into the history. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, traditional uh, account of the Quran's uh, history, how it came to be in our hands today, uh, 14 centuries, 13, 14 centuries after uh, it first appeared on the scene. And uh, we will look at the critical scholarship. We'll begin to look at the critical scholarship and the current state of it, which has changed actually uh, in some respects since uh, a couple of years ago when we first taught this course. But many of the major outlines, as you know, um, uh, Jay have been the the uh, groundwork has been laid by people like uh, like uh, Cook and uh, uh, Patricia Crone and um, well many many of the scholars we'll be talking about in introducing many of these people uh, these names um, and some of their work throughout the course without trying to overwhelm people with the uh, vast breadth and technical um, uh, nature of it uh, we'll go into some of the technical stuff. But um, we're doing a little bit more from Watt and Bell in that second week. Um, and I also have assigned as a reading um, a uh, some section from uh, Michel Kuyper, uh, a French scholar who did an interesting look at some of the uh, literary patterns, particularly the um, uh, chiastic structures that he believes he found in the, um, in the Quran. And I just want to uh, open people's eyes to the various um, uh, uh, reasons that the Quran, it, it's interesting from, from different directions and chiastic structures in literatures from that period are nothing unusual. Um, but it can, uh, you know, when you're, we're looking to analyze something, uh, we want to be aware of the various, uh, ways that it can be analyzed and considered. So, um, and then, uh, on that week also, we have a, a few more shorter uh, chapters, surahs of the of the Quran that we'll do. And uh, as we talk about the history and uh, critical scholarship on that, or begin to talk about the critical scholarship. The third week, of course, the Quran is uh, when we talk about what is the Quran. Um, one of the things I gave a lecture about this uh, down in uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, several months ago, and the lecture was titled, What is the Quran? I, I recall that was the lecture. That was the title. Um, and in that talk, I emphasize primarily that the Quran is a work of theology. It is a theological argument. And so it's, it's many other things too, but, but in, in, in the central core, it is a, um, it is a statement. Uh, it, it makes certain assertions, theological assertions. And so in the third week, we want to look at the major themes that the Quran deals with. And we're especially going to focus in on its theological claims and assertions some of which are similar to those of the Bible and some of which are 180 degrees um, in disagreement with uh, those in the Bible. And uh, some we'll, we'll just lay out what those are and talk about them so that uh, students can have a good understanding of that uh, very, very important aspect because, because that is uh, basically at its heart what, what the Quran is dealing with in my view. In the uh, fourth week, uh, we will look at uh, more closely at the Quran's history, whereas we did talk, we will have talked about the uh, general overview of its history. We're going to go in the fourth week into a deep look at the uh, way that the Quran came to be into our hands as a physical object, especially. So um, the Quran, as some students will know, has been transmitted orally. Many people today have memorized it completely uh, and can recite it on command uh, at any at any moment it's a remarkable feat of memory actually but um no, there are certain features of the quran that make it uh make it uh, a little bit more conducive to memorization in that way but it's still a feat of memory to do that 
Um, but we'll be focusing in that week, the fourth week, on the transmission as a physical object. Um, we have manuscripts that have reached us from 1,400 years ago, 1,300 years ago, um, partly you know, preserved on parchments, in some cases preserved on papyrus. And um, we will talk about how those were created, um, what their features are, how some, in some ways they are um, uh, judged in terms of their age, the script styles, the uh, application of the various types of distinguishing marks, the diacritics and the vowel marks. And um, from the from its earliest time, from the seventh century uh, and the progression to um, the uh, more formal text and the Ottoman Qurans and so forth. So you can get a view of our, uh, a general overview understanding of uh, when when you open a Quran today, how, how did it come to be? Where did it come from? Uh, what are its uh, what are its features and so forth? And uh, this plays into its history. Obviously, when we look at history of anything really, um, and and when you do have physical objects, those objects are really important, especially you know because they can be dated to the time um, that the object came into being. And it's a little bit different. And we'll talk about this more that day. But it's a little bit different from a. Um, um, a, a historical report. Um, if a history was written down at a certain time, then you have a, a moment, sort of an anchor point that that was the what was understood to have happened. But but physical objects are interesting because inscriptions and coins and stuff like that they've got a date on them in many cases. And manuscripts, you may not have a date on it, but you can radiocarbon date it. And you can uh, make judgments in other ways. So uh, we really want to focus in on the physicality of the uh, of the Quran as an object in that fourth week. Okay, in the fifth week, uh, we will go into um, the uh, different ways that the Quran has been uh, interpreted. Um, as, as we know, there are lots and lots of uh, Muslims in the world, not, not as many as there are uh, people who call themselves Christians, but there are about 1.8, maybe 1.9 billion Muslims in the world. And there is a lot of variety within uh, the, uh, among the people who call themselves Muslim around the world. Uh, so we don't want to be blind to that. But um, but the Quran, being a work of theology, is also a an object that has uh, it, it doesn't just uh, it, you know people believe that it stands uh, stands alone, and there are people who take this uh, the view that of the Quran only um, and try to uh, understand it in that way. Um, but uh, there's a very large and rich and uh, in many ways uh, diverse uh, tradition over many centuries of interpreting the Quran, understanding what it means here and there and um, what are the theological concepts. Some of them are not disputed. They're accepted by all or most people who call themselves Muslim. But um, there's a good deal of um, the variety. And, and so when we take a passage and um, as students, the main objective uh, on that week in the four, in the fifth week is to will be to um, uh, understand when a person who is trying to approach the Quran from a believing perspective, um, what are the sort of uh, literatures that they're going to be looking at, uh, the, the the major books that they'll be reading, how are they going to be. Uh, um, you know, looking at this commentary, and we'll, we'll give examples from various commentaries to show how um, verses or chapters or themes are uh, expounded upon by those who have looked at it uh, from a believing perspective uh, in the past. And uh, we have more reading from Watt and Bell uh, that and during that period, as well as some further reading from from some other surahs of the Quran, and. Um, the uh, the other thing aspect of that that we'll be dealing with that week is the um, the intertextuality of the Quran. So these theological themes, as I already mentioned, are related to theological themes of the Bible um, and uh, and of other texts and scriptures uh, possibly as well. And by related, I don't mean to uh, imply um, you know we want to approach everything from a scholarly perspective, but um, there are obviously points where the Quran is in conversation with uh, other texts and and so we want to recognize what those uh, what those are and uh, start to think about what it uh, what it may mean and also within the Quran itself there is an important concept of um, what is called 
abrogation. Uh, there's an Arabic word for it uh, as well. Um, but uh, at, at some point, um, fairly early on, it was recognized quite obviously that the Quran not only uh, disagrees with uh, the uh, at points with the other scriptures that it uh, says that it confirms, but it also disagrees with itself on a key uh, theological points. And so there came to be this idea of uh, this theological um, concept when applying the Quran of uh, cancel the Quran canceling out earlier scriptures where it disagrees with them and canceling out itself. Uh, at points where a later scripture, later um, verse, uh, can't uh, disagrees with an earlier one. We will also be uh, talking a little bit about the uh, um, uh, allegations of textual um, corruption in the other scriptures and also allegations that have uh, been made. Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure how far we'll go into that of, of textual corruption in the Quran itself, but I think the main thing that I, I mentioned, if I recall back on that week that we'll be talking about is the um, uh, some of the episodes that are well attested in the even the Islamic literature of um, uh, moments where uh, such as the one that's uh, dealt with by uh, Salman Rushdie and uh, in his book and um, and, and so forth that uh, where Muhammad himself was uh, had a verse revealed and then realized later, according to the traditional account, that it was uh, not from God. And so um, it, 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 these kind of things just raise uh, interesting questions. We don't need to deal with or answer every single question, but uh, the main point of this course is for students to be aware of the, um, uh, of the uh, lay of the land and what is out there uh, on these things. And, uh, and then we'll talk also just very briefly, we've got a lot to cover in the fifth week about the, uh, about the alleged uh, uniqueness um, of, of the Quran. Um, it, it is uh, often asserted um, that the Quran is, and by alleged, I, I don't mean to cast aspersions, but there is a there's a claim made that um, uh, that the Quran itself, its uh, unsurpassed beauty, its um, uh, uh, remarkable nature, sometimes the um, uh, knowledge that it uh, expresses that uh, is uh, maybe way ahead of its time, from the time that it was that it came into existence, is a are, are signs of um, the Quran's uh, divine origin. And so we'll think about those things and talk about them uh, a little bit. Um, it is not generally recorded that Muhammad had um, in, did miracles, although if you look at, at the biography of Muhammad, uh, you will find some uh, miracles kind of uh, reported in that. It's unclear whether they are um, early or late uh, or you know or original or, or whatever but for many Muslims the um, the Quran's uniqueness and literary qualities are seen to be uh, it's the uh, internal evidence of its divine origin so there we go so that's week five now we're gonna um, talk on the sixth week we're coming up on the end here about uh, a couple well I mean various aspects of the Quran manuscripts themselves and uh, those watching some of those watching will know that this is the the manuscripts have been the focus and the area of my own uh, research and attention for, uh, well, I mean, uh, nearly going on a couple decades now. And so I've had a lot of personal interaction with the manuscripts. I've traveled around the world and looked at them, uh, photographed them, uh, spent a lot of time pouring over the photographs and over the manuscripts themselves to uh, think about uh, them and, and see what their features are and what they contain. And so in this um, sixth week, we will talk about uh, what I'm, you know, what I'm looking at. I'll let you into my world and we will talk about the, uh, the codicology, the way the, uh, uh, the um, uh, codices, the, the, the preparation of the manuscripts, the binding of them into books, uh, the various uh, features of the, that we look at in, in dating, such as the, uh, the margins, the num number of lines, the orientation of the page, and um, you know the script styles and ink inks and all those different things. And then we'll also talk about some of the uh, textual features, um, the progression of the script styles some more, and uh, and then also the uh, details of the text. Some of the uh, one of the, one of the readings for that week is from Marijn Van Houten, where um, uh, he looks at the textual evidence, actually what is written on the page and uh, draws some certain conclusions from that. Um, just parenthetically and sort of to give a teaser for that lecture, um, 
there is well I and mean, i have a a youtube channel that some people will be familiar with where we talk it's titled variant quran um there is variation within the quran manuscripts uh, to a certain extent it's not uh, extreme in most cases but uh, but there is some interesting variation and so um, as you look at the variation among manuscripts, uh, we're also thinking about, can you tell if there's a family history between the manuscript? Can you tell, for example, which manuscript was copied from which other manuscript, uh, which manuscripts belong within a, uh, within a family and so forth? And we aren't going to deal uh, extensively. We don't have time to deal with everything extensively in this course, but we will talk about some of those things and also uh, give a little glimpse um, through uh, Dr. Van Putin's paper into uh, the, the way that scholars have been approaching these questions to um, uh, discern whether there is, for example, in that case, an archetype that we can point back to that uh, some people have called uh, Uthmanic, tracing back to the time that Uthman had his campaign of suppression, uh, where he um, uh, uh, chose, had a authoritative manuscripts prepared and then suppressed by uh, destruction through burning or other means, uh, anything that uh, disagreed with what um, became the preferred manuscript. Yeah, on the seventh week, uh, we're going to continue our work with Quran manuscripts by focusing in a little bit more uh, narrowly on the work that I've done with the variants and the corrections. And so I'm gonna give you examples of the uh, corrections that I've, uh, some of the corrections that I've come across, we'll talk through them. I'll introduce um, to you the variety of the types of corrections that we look at and some of the features of them and uh, talk through and try and give you some some new things that maybe haven't been talked about on the YouTube channel and, and so forth. But um, just again, getting the lay of the land so that you can have a good understanding, uh, at least uh, to a good base knowledge of what we're talking about when we're looking at the textual criticism of Quran manuscripts as my mentor, uh, the dear departed um, uh, Lake Keith Small. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it went to be the, with the Lord a number of years ago, uh, several years ago. He wrote the book Textual Criticism and Quran Manuscripts. And um, so we'll be looking at it as a broader category, but then focusing in on my uh, on my work with corrections as well. And we'll look at um, uh, that week, the work of uh, Dr. Tayar Altakulic, who's uh, a Muslim scholar in Turkey, who's uh, respected in the field and uh, has done some important work there. Um, as well. Uh, so he made a refutation uh, of, of my book and published that and uh, which by the way, a, uh, a full uh, like actually a, a book response to that is uh, it's forthcoming. I'm very busy. I've been doing a lot of different things, but uh, it is in progress. Uh, believe me, it is uh, being being prepared and I'm going to get that out hopefully very soon. Um, uh, hopefully this this summer, but I don't want to promise dates because it's it always winds up taking longer than I than I thought. So that is week number seven. And then uh, in final, the final week, uh, number eight, we will just be pulling everything together in summary by talking about the, uh, the popular theological and apologetic implications. This uh, course is being offered by Veritas International University, which is a uh, Christian um, uh, university. It's uh, geared toward preparing you. I believe many of the students are, are going to be uh, Christian believers. And so to think through and understand what the um, apologetic implications, apo uh, apologetics, of course, meaning um, giving a reason, giving an answer for the faith that you have. And, um, and uh, you know, certainly on the, the reverse side of that, uh, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, you do a lot of work with uh, polemics, which is um, being critical of uh, things that you believe not to be true or to, uh, to sort of poke it poke at things to see if they stand up under scrutiny, I guess is a, another way of doing it. And if they do or if they don't, but, um, you know, so those are the, the two aspects of that. But we want to think about the uh, theological and uh, apologetic implications of what we have already studied and, um, and think about those both at a scholarly level and at a popular level uh, as you are interacting with uh, friends, neighbors, maybe new acquaintances, uh, colleagues at work and so forth. How can you be um, engaging in good and fruitful discussion of the things that really matter in 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 life, which are the, these questions of who are we, why are we here, who is God, what is he like, what does he expect of us, and so forth. These are questions that are asked uh, and answered in some ways by, uh, in many ways, by the Quran, and they're asked and answered by um, uh, when we look at the Bible. And uh, as we said at the beginning, 
um, those answers are different uh, in many of the most important places uh, in the Quran and in the Bible. So uh, these important questions need to be considered and, and thought about. As human beings, this is probably one of the most important things, probably the most important thing that we will do during our short time here. So that is the um, over the entire purpose of the course and uh, to think about these things, to do it um, um, with integrity and, and thoughtfulness and respect and uh, and to help each other along in that. I've done a good deal of <laughs> good deal of work myself and I haven't reached the end of the road yet, but uh, I do want to share these things with you along the way. And so I look forward to this opportunity to spend these uh, special hours with you during the uh, period of this course this summer. Thanks so much, Daniel. This is terrific. As you have seen, Daniel, and those of you who may not know this, Daniel is considered probably one of the, the foremost or one of the foremost uh, scholars when it comes to manuscript evidence, when it comes to the changes. This is his book, The Corrections. Uh, he's coming out with another book that will be supporting this. In fact, he'll be coming out with a whole series of books that talk about these changes and the difficulties with the earliest manuscripts. Now, Daniel is an apologist. He is an apologist. He is not a polemicist. I am a polemicist. And these, this whole degree is called Master of Art in Apologetics and Polemics of Islam. So both defense and offense are taught in this course. Daniel will be doing the apologetical side of it. I will be coming in and helping out with some of the polemical material, how would we can use it uh, in our engagement, in our discussions, in our debates with Muslims uh, concerning the Quran. As you know, this is a Christian institution. Daniel just got done saying that. Therefore, this is only for Christians. I know some of you have always got upset. What about me? I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic. Maybe I'm a Muslim. I'd like to take this course. No, this is a seminary. This is meant only for Christians. Therefore, please do not register unless you are a Christian. Now, obviously, you do need to register. And that's why we do have right down here. Look there. It says info at ed, uh, ves edu. You just need to write in, uh, ask, and say you would like to register for IS506. This is the sixth course in a series of 10 courses that we're, uh, that we're giving here, five courses a year, eight week long, each one of them always on Monday nights from eight o'clock till 10 o'clock in the evening, and then another hour usually for Q&A. In this case, this course, IS 506, the historical assessment of the Quran, taught by Dr. Dan Brubaker. I will be there as well to be involved in the Q&A part, so to show you how this can be used polemically. But this is really his lectures, this is his material, this is his expertise, and he's going to share all this amazing eight lectures. You've now given been given an overview of them. You need to register, and you need to do so before June the 19th. Now, now just to be clear, there are three levels of students. If you want to take this as a master's degree, this is an accredited master's degree program, uh, then you have to do an awful lot of work and you have to pay an awful, uh, not an awful, but much more than the others. For a master's degree level, the, each unit, this course is three units long. So each unit is $330. So that makes it about $990, almost $1,000 if you want to take it for a master's degree. But if you do take it for a master's degree, you're going to have to write a paper. You're going to have to do the reading. You're going to have to do a reading log each week. You're going to have to do a discussion, be involved in a discussion during the week of what Daniel is teaching you. And then you'll have to do a final, a final uh, uh, test, a final exam, and then write a paper. But that we will give to all of you. You'll get the syllabus, so you'll know exactly what's coming beforehand with all the reading assignments week by week by week by week. Daniel and myself and Dr. Daniel Janasik will be looking at your papers. We'll be looking at your discussions. We'll be involved in those discussions. That's the great thing about this course. It doesn't just happen only on Monday night. It continues throughout the week. And we have large, large discussions going on between the students from all over the world. We have over 300 students now in the MAPI program from about 26 different countries. And we'll be involved in these discussions, especially as Daniel is giving these lectures and bringing up this new material. Those, as I should have said earlier about the master's degree, you have the eight weeks of lecture, but then you have 15 weeks to get in your papers. So your papers and your, uh, your final exam don't need to be until September the 25th. Though the lectures finish on August the 7th, you have another you have another uh, seven weeks in order to get all the material to us. Those who want to take it for audit, if you want to take it for audit, you only pay $280. 
And the great thing about audit is you will then be also be permitted to be part of the the group that are discussing throughout the week. You will be given a, uh, a a signature and a code so you can participate in the Populi. That is our platform where we do all our discussions, where we put up all our papers, uh, where we have our talks during the week and where we also have the logs. So you'll be able to read on them. You'll be able to discuss. You'll be able to ask questions from Daniel, myself, and the two Daniels, really, Daniel Janosik and Daniel Brubaker and myself, so that we'll be able to engage with you during the week. That's for those who want it for audit. Now there is a third category, and these are people who do not want it for. Uh, they do not want to be part of that discussion group during the week. They just want to hear the lectures. They just want to hear the, uh, hear Daniel speak, and then they want to throw questions at Daniel and the the the, the other uh, Daniel and myself after the lectures. That is for personal enrichment. We call it PE for those people who just want to be part of the lectures itself on Monday nights. It only costs $225 for the whole course. Now, hold on a minute. You might say, yes, but I live in Europe or I, I live in Africa or I live in Indonesia and I'm fast asleep at eight o'clock Eastern time here in the United States. Don't worry. You don't have to be there live. We are recording every lecture. Daniel's lectures will be recording, including the Q&A periods. And then we send it to you the very next day. You get it the very next day. You'll get the URL so you can watch the lecture at your own leisure. Also, Daniel will be putting out PowerPoints for everything that he's talking about. Those PowerPoints will be sent to you. He'll be referring to and putting up PDFs of articles that he is referring to. Those PDFs will go to all of you. That includes the master's degree students. That includes the audit students. And that includes the personal enrichment students. You get all of the lectures and the PowerPoints and the PDFs that everybody gets, every student gets, because I send them to you the very next day by MailChimp. Now, obviously, you need to register first, and it's important that you do register. There is the registration info at ves.edu. And tell our registrar that you would like this course, IS-506, the Historical Assessment of the Crown, that you would like to register for this course. You need to do it uh, by June the 19th. That's just a few weeks away. Even if you forget to do it on time, don't worry. We will, even if you come in late as a student, we will still bring you on board and send you all the material that you miss. It will be great to have as many of you there, especially the first night, the 19th of June. Why? Because that's when we introduce all the students. We want everybody to f know who the students are. So we become a family because it becomes, it's that family atmosphere that most students love. And the fact that you'll be making relationships with people from all over the world, you'll be able to see who they are. You'll be able to see them on the, on the screen. And then you'll be, can also contact them during the week. Now, obviously the, there, uh, the, these are live lectures. We purposely do this. These are not recorded except for one. There will be one lecture. That's lecture number two. The second week, uh, which is June the 26th, because Daniel has to be elsewhere, he will not be available that night. It's a very important night for him. We are going to, he is going to record that and we're going to release it there at eight o'clock that evening so that people can watch it in their own time. You don't have to watch it live. You don't have to watch it that day. You can watch it whenever. And then the next week, uh, which will be July the 3rd, he will then open himself up to Q&As from the previous week. So that's how we're going to get around that. But that's the only week that we will have recorded. All the rest of the weeks, you get to see Daniel, you get to hear Daniel, you get to question him. And believe me, I don't know if there's any question he's not been able to answer. So Come on board. It'd be great to have you. Daniel, any last thing you want to say before we uh, head, uh, head out and get people registered? Yes, uh, I really look forward to it. It's uh, always a pleasure to meet people who are uh, who are interested in the same kind of things that I'm interested in and, and have done. Um, I just wanted to make one comment on what you said a little bit ago, Jay, um, about being an apologist. I don't uh, uh, actually being an apologist is not a... Um, uh, disrespectful thing uh, at all. It's a very worthy calling, uh, but I generally present myself as a historian of the early history of the Quran uh, and try to uh, do that. Although in many ways, uh, all of us who are uh, presenting a case for our Christian faith, we are apologists. So just wanted to clarify that and uh, and uh, and make, make note of that. Good. Excellent. So come on board. We'd love to see you. 
June the 19th. That's soon to come. So do register, get your name down there, get your material out there. And we, as soon as you do register, I will be notified and I will send you a welcoming email and show you all of what you need to do, what the meeting ID is, and also the passcode so that you can participate with us. We'd love to see you there. That's just a few weeks from now. Until then, this is Daniel the Brubaker, myself, here on the East Coast of America. Over and out.